uh, everyone, welcome to the Grand Rounds today. This is uh, Dr. Johnny Faircloth, and I'm going to introduce my friend, uh, Dr. Andrews Leverton. Uh, he was uh, trained at McMurray University and Trinity University, and then did medical school at St. George's University School of Medicine in Grenada. He was graduated magna cum laude. And then we had the uh, good fortune to have him join us for residency here in Amarillo, where he uh, was recognized and awarded multiple times. Uh, he became one of our chief residents. He received teaching awards. And then we were very, very pleased to have him stay on with us. And he's now one of our faculty. Um, again, he's already been recognized. He's He's actually got the Regional Dean's New Faculty Award twice. Um, I think he wouldn't mind me sharing with everyone that he's a, uh, a, a great guitar player. And um, he's also uh, quite the uh, fan of the Marvel comic and Star Wars universes. So um, if there's any questions or comments on that later, I'm sure he'd be happy to answer those in addition to his presentation on ADHD from his perspective. So uh, everyone, please welcome my friend and colleague, Dr. Anders Leverton. Thank you, Dr. Faircloth. I, I appreciated that. Of course, the only reason I, I did come to uh, Amarillo was because um, I knew that I would have at least one cowboy fanatic to watch the games with while I was doing residency since my family is uh, a few hours away. Uh, cause come on, nobody wants to root for the giants, right? All right. So, uh, welcome everybody for being here today. I'm excited, uh, to talk to y'all about, uh, a little hint of what we're going to talk about here. As you can see in the screen, we got two sides there. So without further ado, let me go ahead and introduce what we're going to talk about and let's get ready to rock. Oh, Hey, look. It's Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Holy crap. I didn't think he was going to stop by today. That's awesome. Some of you might know him from movies. I know him from way back in the day when he would go, if you can smell what The Rock, the eyebrow going, is cooking. But I digress. I was actually talking about let's get ready to rock as in, I want to rock. <laughs> right? And that's, of course, Twisted Sister. That's right. There's D. Snyder right there. In fact, there's one time I was actually D. Snyder for Halloween. That's me in the middle, uh, rocking it out with my zebra pants. He doesn't want that. But I digress again. I got, I got distracted. So how can you mix rock and roll with rocks? Oh, you know what? That's easy. Maybe you like the Rolling Stones, right? Who doesn't like that with Charlie, Keith, uh, Mick, and Ronnie? But maybe you're not a fan of the Rolling Stones, and maybe you like the Beatles. Who doesn't like the Beatles? The Beatles are pretty cool. Up here in the top left, you got John, then of course, Paul, and then George Harrison, who's the best. And then there's Ringo. He's okay. Uh, and then maybe you just like rocks in general. Rocks are pretty cool and they're pretty strong and they're pretty heavy and you can do a lot of stuff with rocks. Hey, you know who can break a rock? Probably the Hulk. The Hulk can break a rock, right? Because he's the strongest there is, but he's not the best superhero there is. That's actually Captain America. He's by far the best superhero. That is a taste of what my everyday is like if I am not uh, in the zone or focused on. We can talk about one thing and then we're going to go off into a million directions. Who knows we're going to do? I might think about movies. I might think about songs. That's just a, a glimpse into uh, what happens in my head. So today we are going to be talking about ADHD. Uh, common myths and controversies that frequently uh, I encounter within the medical field from day to day. And I want to give you all an insider's view on that. So without further ado, uh, for disclosures, I actually have nothing to disclose except that I do have ADHD and I've been losing my focus for over 30 years. Uh, and I have to warn you, this may happen during the presentation. If so, just bear with me. We'll get through it to, uh, together. That's the one thing about Zoom visits. I don't know if people are laughing. So all I know, I hope that there's not just clerkets going around, but I'm hoping people are smiling and uh, at least entertained. 
Uh, but in all seriousness, I have nothing to disclose, no financial incentives or no partnerizations with any drug companies, any other sorts that way. So my, my plan for us today is I would like for us all to challenge modern thinking. And we're going to be exploring several aspects of this, including pre-existing biases that we all may have and common controversies. Now, I do like discussing controversies because I honestly believe controversies is where our discussion should begin in medicine in all fields. We can all agree you should treat infections with antibiotics, but we tend to avoid the controversial topics because they're controversial, but that's where research should really be aimed at, and that's where we as physicians and providers, teachers, parents, should be getting better and making the, the hard discussions. So it's good, right? Goals. Uh, after this presentation, I hope to improve uh, provider understanding of ADHD. I want to clarify, of course, myths that inhibit our treatment of ADHD. And I want to increase awareness of the health disparities that are present in our nation and in our community in this lens. So before we continue, I'm going to give y'all about a minute to do one of these three options here. So on your phone, on your computer, uh, open another window and you can go to pollev.com slash AndersLevert613 or you can text AndersLevert613 to 37607 or if you have the Poll EV app, log in and go to AndersLevert613's presentation. And I'll give you all a minute to do that because of course, technology won't behave when you want it to. And you can use whatever name you want when it asks you. I won't be able to see your name. So if you have a, a secret fantasy to be called uh, Big Boss, now's your chance. Okay. So uh, let's get going to our first, uh, and I, I will direct you when you need to use this as going. So let's get going. So I've also noticed that we have Dr. Nakvi in attendance, and I would be uh, I wouldn't be so bold as to not introduce you and welcome you all to this presentation as he always did uh, when he was here in Amarillo to this nice warm uh, end of summer beginning of fall day in Amarillo, Texas. Now in the background here we got a, a great sculpture of, of Zeus, and this is where we're going to begin our conversation on myths. Myths typically come in two flavors, okay? There is the one myth that we think of as a traditional story, and these would be myths such as, you know, we think of Greek mythology, the three sisters of fate, Prometheus and the theft of fire, Pandora's box, the abduction of Persephone by Hades, or the name giving of Athens. Uh, that's one type of myth. And then the other one is a widely held false belief, uh, such as uh, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers are going to win the Super Bowl this year. No way. It's going to be the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> uh, so without further ado, let me go to our first question. So I'm going to direct you here. And I want you to go ahead and on your device or phone, uh, go ahead and enter a response of what you think about when you hear ADHD. All right, someone wrote, hi, Oer, hyper, there we go, kid, distracted, oh, here we go, treatable, stay, oh, this is nice, common, boys, can't sit still, illness, squirrel, <laughs> pattern, interventions, meds, impulsive, dopamine, thinking, Dr. Leverton, very true. I want to know who wrote that. I'm going to find out. I'm just kidding. I can't. Uh, fun. I like those. Sustained, changing, overdiagnosed. Good. Inability, treatable. That's really good. I like this. So I'm going to pause it here. Excellent. Good. So I see a lot of great... Uh, Great uh, descriptions here, neurodevelopmental, overdiagnosed, uh, inattentive, intelligent, impulsive, undertreated. So we have one that is undertreated, we have overdiagnosed. I love it. 
I love it. This is great for our conversation today. So is that going forward? Let's give you another question here. In your opinion, who treats the majority of children with ADHD? And these questions also help me take a drink. So I love it. And I like to do it this way because I know how it is to attend a big uh, presentation and everybody gets nervous about answering, right? We don't want our voices to be heard, even though you may be right. So remember, this is an opinion question, so you can't be wrong or right. All right, let's take a peek here. I can get it to cooperate. So let's see, 40 people answered and 90% said doctors, uh, parents, teachers are the next biggest one, and then no one said disorder doesn't exist. Excellent. So let's talk about the truth and let's see if you can handle it, okay? So in fact, PCPs actually do treat the majority of childhood ADHD. Why is that? Why doesn't they go see a specialist? So uh, that's easy. There's not as many child and adolescent psychiatrists in the world as there are PCPs. And then not only that, not only, are there, not only are there not that many, but they also have wait times and are fully booked. And unfortunately, there is a stigma from seeing a psychiatrist that still very much exists in our society today. In the general population, there are many ideas that are based on opinion and not scientific facts as well. And some of these relate to ADHD medications. And we're going to get into some of these today that also limit our treating of ADHD. And again, lastly, we need to be careful that our own opinions uh, don't affect our patient's care. But are we really surprised at all by this? Because even in the medical field, mental health is stigmatized among physicians. Uh, medical students hear this as they rotate through surgery, internal medicine. Everybody's like, oh, I guess we'll call psych, right? Or if they can't explain it, it's psych. It's not real. This is something that we all face. And I know that's a bunch of medical students that since they have their camera off, they're all like, they'll let nobody see me. Okay. So unfortunately, healthcare professionals do tend to view mental health negatively. And this is something I would like to hopefully start to change in our world today. So to fully understand ADHD, this is going to be like the most boring slide I show you right here. I don't agree with reading things off slides, but we have to do it just this one time today uh, to understand what exactly is ADHD. And we're going to look at the DSM-5 definition of it. So to meet criteria, how DSM-5 works is you have to meet all criteria, each number, each actually lettered criteria. So in this case, A through E, everything has to be present to, to meet the definition if you're following the rules. So first, you need a persistent pattern of inattention or hyperactivity uh, that interferes with functioning or development. So it has to interfere and it has to be characterized by either one or two. So let's talk with one first. And I've bolded some things and highlighted some things to draw out. So the first domain is inattention. And you have to have six or more of the following symptoms. And it has to be inconsistent with your developmental level. And it has to negatively impact directly on social or academics as occupational activities. So number one files to give close attention to details, you're making careless mistakes, and schoolwork at work or other activities. You might have difficulty sustaining your attention in tasks or, or even play activities, uh, remaining focused during lectures, conversation. That was actually me a lot in uh, school, especially when PowerPoint started coming into play because it's like, do you want me to read this or do you want me to listen to you? I can't do both. Which one do you want me to do? Um, Next, we have some more. Does not seem to listen when spoken to directly. Does not follow through on instructions and fails to finish school or chores or duties in the workplace. Has difficulty organizing tasks and activities, as described as right here. Um, they avoid or dislike or is reluctant to engage in tasks that require sustained mental effort. And me, too, that was reading for me. It was so hard because you'd be sitting there reading and then you'd read the word like purple. And I think about Mace Windu's lightsaber. And then I'd have to really sit there and focus, like, no, 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 focus. You read the same paragraph over and over and over again uh, just to, you know, learn things. Maybe you lose things necessary for tasks or activities, schools, pencils. That was totally my sister. She had to have two lockers. <laughs> I don't mean to embarrass her, but, it, but it's true. 
Uh, I lose my keys all the time, wallet, uh, easily distracted by extraneous stimuli. And this happened like we showed you earlier in the presentation, how I introduced the topic. Or as you're forgetful in your daily activities. You have to have six of those to be qualified for the inattentive type. Okay, but there's also two. So maybe hyperactivity and impulsivity. So you need six or more of these. And again, inconsistent with your developmental level and has to negatively impact on your social or academic occupational activities. So you often fidget, tap your hands, feet, or squirm in the seat. The residents know when I'm seeing a patient, I end up tying my leg. I'm doing it right now. My legs are twisted as much as they can go because it helps me to focus. Leaving your seat is what we see in kids when remaining seat is expected. This lot in school often runs about or climbs where they, people shouldn't be running about or climbing. Remember this one later. It's going to relate to a joke later on, and I want it to be good. Uh, often unable to play or engage in leisure activities quietly. Okay. Often on the go, acts as if they're driven by a motor talks excessively, uh, often blurts out an answer before a question's even been completed, difficulty waiting his or her turn, or interrupts or intrudes on others. So those are the symptom sets. You have to have six of those. Okay, let's go to the next part, or either one or both. If you have several, and these symptoms have to be present prior to the age of 12 years, um, you need two or more of the settings. So they can't just be doing these things at school, right? Because maybe they're in economics, and economics is boring. Who didn't lose their attention in economics class? That's probably why, you know, doing taxes and all that kind of stuff is hard now. Uh, there is clear evidence that these symptoms are interfering or reduce their quality of their academic or occupational functioning. Now, this can be things as, hey, the kid's about to get kicked out of daycare because they can't sit still. They're throwing things at the teacher. They're arguing with the teacher, right? That that does interfere. They might, might be even getting invited to parties or causing trouble at home. And of course, they don't. You have part E is actually really important. Because part E is you have to rule out all these other things too. So for practitioners, it's not just, oh, they meet these six criteria, we're done. No, they meet the six criteria, but have you evaluated them for anxiety? Have you developed, evaluated them for substance intoxication or withdrawal? And there's even medical conditions too, such as you know, hyperthyroidism could make you fidgety and restless. So make sure not only are you getting the positives, but you're also doing the pertinent negative aspects of diagnosing ADHD as well. Now, this is all the DSM-5 criteria, and it didn't mention anything about emotional dysregulation. It didn't really talk about executive function dysregulation. So there's some things it does miss on, but for general, these are the things you have to have. Now, ADHD has a great differential diagnosis. So let's talk first about mentioning some neurodevelopmental disabilities. So some of them you can see up here in the most small print that no one can read. That's my bad. Uh, it says intellectual disability, uh, autism spectrum learning, or language disorders can also be a differential. So again, evaluate kids for these too. Don't just call them ADHD. Make sure you're giving them their due diligence. Other psychiatric disorders, as we talked about just prior to this, anxiety, depression, bipolar, adjustment disorder, uh, or even medical conditions, sleep disorders, epilepsy. I already talked about thyroid. Maybe they can't hear. Anemia, iron deficiency anemia can cause uh, behavioral changes, as can obstructive sleep apnea can look like ADHD. So make sure we're not just doing a history, oh, they meet, and I'm not going to look in your throat. I'm not going to feel your thyroid. Make sure you're doing everything that you should be doing to rule out things that makes not only does that give the patient better care that makes you a better provider so there are a lot of comorbidities uh, that adhd has that not only make it more important to diagnose so they can be properly treated but it also muddies the picture it's about 75 percent of kids with adhd also have a comorbid mental health disorder uh, so let's look at all of them and see if we can figure out which one's the co most common going to be. So here's a list of some comorbidities that are frequently found with ADHD. You have oppositional defiant, anxiety, depression, conduct. Now, remember, I told you that in the differential diagnosis was depression and anxiety. So they can both be occurring at the same time. Uh, developmental disorders, uh, learning disabilities, autism spectrum language, intellectual disability, Tourette's, and substance use. Here's some unique features that are with all of those. Um, that you can read. Now, again, let's take a guess. What do you think the most common is with ADHD? So actually the most common comorbid problems in people with ADHD, number one, 
is going to be this 40 to 90 percent of language disorders, which is going to, they're going to have evidence of misunderstanding, word finding difficulties, pragmatic difficulties. I can totally attest to that. A lot of the times I'll be having conversations with my family and they will stop me and be like, you said this, but you meant this, I think. I'll be like, oh yeah, totally. The other most common one is anxiety. 30 to 40% of kids also have anxiety and excessive worry and decreased energy. So rule that out and treat accordingly. So let's get to the first myth. This is, of course, the Loch Ness Monster, which when I look at this picture, I don't know why anybody thought this was real. The, the monster's barely bigger than a ripple. That is totally like a stick, but it's okay. Nonetheless, it is what it is. So next question, ADHD is not a real disorder. Is this true, false, or it's only real during childhood? All right, let's go. We're at 40. And again, if you forgot the instructions, they are up top of how to answer. Five, four, three, two, one. Go on, you can do it. All right. So 13% said true, 88% said false. Okay. So good, I'm glad that we have some disagreement because that's what makes this a good topic. So let's see, what is the answer? The answer is false, but let's see if I convince you. So here we go, thanks Han Solo. It's true, all of it. So ADHD is very, 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 very real. In fact, cases have been described since 1775. That's a long time ago. Now, actually, the constellation of these behavioral symptoms was defined by J Dr. George Frederick Still, who's considered to be the father of pediatrics in Britain. So we have to respect him, right, because that's where America comes from, is from Britain. And what he called ADHD, well, they didn't call it ADHD then, but what he described this condition as was an abnormal defect of moral control in children. He found that some affected children could not control the behavior that a typical child would, but they were still smart. So we're smart, we're just immoral, right? That's how he was basically saying ADHD is. So let's talk about the timeline. Again, Dr. Nockfee always liked to talk about how things evolved over time, and I'm going to steal that from him and continue that tradition. So in the 1960s, we're going to, we talk about minimal brain dysfunction and minimal cerebral dysfunction. And these were terms used to describe a collection of physical and behavioral disorders that resulted from disordered brain function. They include motor and coordination, inattention, and impulse control deficits, as well as difficulties with interpersonal relations and emotionality. So this is manifest. I mentioned those already. Sorry, my clicking was not up with my speech. Now, the DSM, second edition, describe childhood hyperactivity and impulsivity as hyperkinetic impulse disorder of childhood. So still in the 1960s, no ADD, ADHD yet. It's hyperkinetic impulse disorder of childhood for previously MBD or MCD. Ah, the empire strikes back. I want y'all to remember this because by DSM-3, we have ADD with or without hyperactivity. And the DSM-3 was brand new in 1980. So yes, ADD or ADHD, the term, is the same age as the Empire Strikes Back. Now, Spider-Man considers this movie uh, an old movie, if you've seen the Marvel Civil War. And, you know, it's really not that old. This is just like 42 years ago. Uh, now, of course, there's been many revisions since. But overall, ADHD is a fairly new diagnosis. And it may not be surprising given how it is resist new it is that how some people may be resistant uh, to diagnosing this. Now we have seen this trend also with the COVID pandemic. There were a lot of physicians who refused to diagnose COVID to treat COVID because they were into up, they were playing with politics. And when medicine and politics mixes, that's that's not good. The truth is what gets hidden. So we've seen this, and it's not surprising at all that we see it with ADHD, too. So what's happening in the ADHD brain? And it's actually not what you may think. So you would assume that because ADHD patients are hyperactive and impulsive, that maybe their brains would be more active. But you actually see the opposite. 
So brain scan studies show differences in the development of the brain in individuals with ADHD, such as cortical thinning in the frontal regions, reduced volume in the infrafrontal gyrus, and reduced gray matter in the parietal, temporal, and occipital cortices. Okay, so let's look at this picture here. All right, here we go. I love pictures. So and let's talk about part A. So this picture is broken down into two parts. You got figure A and you got figure B. Okay, so in part A, you have on this side, the left side of the screen, an exemplary healthy control. And then on this side of the screen, someone with ADHD. And this is their corresponding T1 NPRH images. Okay, now if you look on the individual images, you'll see that there is a clear difference in areas of activity. Look in the frontal region here. You're seeing some green. Now, the more activity is red and the less activity is blue, pink, or purple. Uh, and you can see here, there's some frontal region problems. There's some less activity here. And look at this one. Now, part B is, and this is just individuals, right? So what would be better is if you took a conglomerate of patients and interposed their images on top of each other, which is what they did. And that's part B. You can see that still in part B, it's a little bit less in the, in the frontal regions. Uh, look right here, compared them. And you can see that this measured norepinephrine, and you can see that it's released through the entire mammalian brain, but there is evidence from these, in these studies that ADHD patients are reduced overall in cerebral volume, including the frontal parietal areas, the basal nuclei, and the globus pallidus, and even the cerebellum. Okay, so let's talk about the frontal lobe. And what, what a great way to demonstrate the frontal lobe with, let me share with you this. If I can figure out, okay, hold on, get out of town. Here we go. Can y'all see like a YouTube thing? All yes. right. All right, here we go. Let's watch this. That should break your fall. All if right. Anything. I mean, <laughs> nah, it's good, bro. I don't see anything wrong with this picture. Where's the ski mask? Give him the ski mask. Oh, no, nah, no, nah, we need your face for fame. Yeah, for fame. Yeah, but start from farther. Hey, hey jump from that house to this garage. This is a great idea. Nah, jump with it so it breaks your fall down. That's right. There's the safety aspect. Already? Yeah. yeah. Ah! <laughs> Great fun, guys. Good job. Okay, let's let's talk. Let's talk about let's talk about that. Uh let's go back to this place. So the frontal lobe. So the roles of the frontal lobe. Okay, what's going on here? Are we back on the, the PowerPoint for everybody? Yes. Yes. Okay, excellent. So the frontal lobe has a lot of roles, and there's some in the multitude of cognitive processes, such as executive functioning, attention, memory, and language, and also emotional regulation. Now, typically, in a normal person, the frontal lobe is fully matured by the age of 25. This is a reason why when we look back at some of our earlier years, we do a face fall, right? Because we're like, what were we thinking? However, in individuals with ADHD, their frontal lobe matures later on. Now, this is the reason why also a lot of teens like to engage in the challenges. I'm sure you all have heard of the cinnamon uh, challenge, right? Or of course, the more favorite one that everybody likes to bring up with millennials is the Tide Pod Challenge. Now this next one I'm gonna show you is one I became aware of when I was in college. And I actually wanted to show you this video instead because uh, it's more uh, intimidating and inducing stress. This was called the Training Challenge. This was real. There used to be videos on YouTube of people laying underneath train tracks and you let the train go over you. I don't even think, I don't even have to say anything to, for y'all to know what I'm thinking about that, right? 
that YouTube did remove these videos because they didn't want people copying them. It's obviously not a good idea, right? You need to, hopefully you're thinking wisely before you try something like this. Uh, and in the video, I did saw the kid was fine and he got up and he was like the most excited I've ever seen a person, probably because he realized he didn't die. So frontal lobe, pretty important. So let's go on. How come you don't want to work with me? There we go. So in summary for myth one, cases have been around forever. The diagnosis is relatively new in that there's structural and functional changes of the brain. Okay, let's move on to the next myth. The next myth has to do like this dragon, okay? So get your phones ready or your, your devices and let's go to this question. ADHD is overdiagnosed, true or false? All right, let's go five, four, three, two, one. Let's see, what did y'all think? Ooh, I like this. This is good, 50-50 pretty much. A lot of y'all think true and a lot of y'all not so much if y'all think false. Okay, well, let's see what the answer is. It is actually false. This is not overdiagnosed. So let's talk about some more dragons. ADHD is not overdiagnosed. Now, one of the, this is actually one of the most prevalent neurodevelopmental disorders uh, among children. It's actually estimated that around 8.9% of U.S. children aged 3 to 17 have ADHD. Now, ADHD increases uh, with advancing age, okay, such that we're going to see in, uh, two, in two point, you're going to see in children two to five years old, about 2.1%, 8.9% of the six to 11-year-olds and 11.9% of 12 to 17 year olds. And then interestingly enough, by adulthood, the prevalence decreases to two and a half to 5%. Now, why? Why do you think uh, that happens? Well, I'll give you two, I'll give you two pictures. Okay, which one has ADHD? I'll tell you. One of them for sure does. One of them may, but the jury's still out, right? So on the left, we got a cute little five-year-old. And then on the right, we got a 30-year-old jumping in the clinic, clicking his heels for no good reason. And that is totally me when I had short hair, just an intern having a good time, happy to be here. So with the DSM-5 diagnosis of ADHD made in pre-color, and preschoolers is very difficult to make for four reasons, okay? Number one, demonstrating clinically significant signs and symptoms in more than one setting is very limited if the child is not in care or preschool. Two, the signs and symptoms must be de developmentally inappropriate. So this requires good parent and clinician understanding of typical expectations for age and of the child's developmental level, which frequently mismatch. A lot of parents come into clinic, well, my, my other kid did this and this one's not doing this, so something's wrong with him or vice versa. Maybe this kid was advanced and they're talking earlier, that kind of stuff. Uh, number three, the measure of functional impairment in preschoolers varies with the expectation of the child. And four, there's very few symptom rating scales that are validated for use in preschool age children to support clinical assessment. I tried, uh, I had one patient come in and they were less than the age of six, so I wanted to use the Connors grading scale. Holy hell, I had to like buy a computer program to even grade the thing. And that was the only one I could find uh, for that age group. So we have Vanderbilt's and we have Connors that we frequently think about. And the Vanderbilt one is usually use it over the age of six. Uh, and that one's much easier to grade. You don't need computer software and a whole bunch of stuff to do it. So since you have limitations with screening kids, you can see how hard it is to diagnose. And then as you get older, it's easier to diagnose. So unfortunately with ADHD, there might be biases that get in the way. Now this has been de demonstrated is that white children are more likely to be treated and diagnosed. The prevalence rates for non-Hispanic white children is actually 11.5% compared to 8.9% for non-Hispanic black children and 6.3% for Hispanic children. This is a study done in 2015. 
Now, if we look back all the way to 2013, they did an, an, a longitudinal study of, kinder, of a kindergarten class where their number of participants was over 17,000. And this study also found that minority children were less likely than white children to receive an ADHD diagnosis. This is from 2013. So we see that across age groups, children who are racial or ethnic minorities are less likely to receive a diagnosis and subsequent pharmacologic treatment. This is gonna be important, okay? So unfortunately, this shows and demonstrates that children are getting left behind and this is becoming a missed diagnosis. Now, this is not the first time in medicine where we have had a missed area. Can y'all think of the most common missed area that physician miss in patients? It's pain, okay? In this study up here, pain management was studied and even among uh, African-American doctors, all doctors, regardless of their ethnicity, undertreated minority pain. So there is, this is demonstrating that there are social constructs associated with medical diagnosis and treatment. So we as providers need to be aware that we may have biases that are not on the forefront of our mind. They could be uh, subconscious biases, but this is not the first area where we see discrepancy or uh, maltreatment of patients. And remember, our number one goal as providers is to do no harm. That is our mission. That is what we want to do. That's why we all decided to put on the white coat. Now, uh, we need to diagnose early if possible, because the earlier you diagnose, as with most things in medicine, uh, the later you diagnose puts a delay to treatment and puts the child at increased risk of other comorbid side effects that ADHD has, which you will get into. Another question. Females have less severe ADHD than males. What do y'all think? Is that true? Is that false? Let's go five, four, three, two, one. Okay, so a little bit more people think that's not true. Some people think it is true. Let's see the answer. It's actually false. So remember, we're all here together and we're all equal. So do females get ADHD? Of course they do. However, boys are more than twice as likely to be bad diagnosed. And in these two studies, they found a uh, male to female diagnosis ranging from three to one all the way to 16 to one. That's a lot. Now, why is that happening? Is it because people are there sitting, sitting there thinking like, oh, girls can't have this. <laughs> and they don't do anything about it. Probably not. It's because their presentations are different. Females are more likely to have inattentive symptoms, whereas males are more likely to have impulsive control and hyperactivity. So why is that? And what we see is that there's accumulating research which clearly indicates subtle but important sex differences that ex exist in the symptom profile, as long as their neuropathology and their clinical course. There's also neuropathology that may have hormonal factors, which may play an important role in ADHD in females. Now, although research demonstrates females with ADHD differ from males in important ways, there's little research that evaluates the differences in treatment response. So, but given these subtle but important differences in presentation and developmental course of ADHD, it is essential that both clinical practice and the research be informed by awareness of these differences in order to better identify and promote quality of care to girls and women with ADHD. Okay. Uh, in a 10-year follow-up, uh, of girls aged six to 12 years by Hinshaw, they found a higher adult, they found a higher number of risk for suicide and self-injury by adulthood among girls with ADHD compared to males, and also more likely to have comorbid conditions, including a higher chance of eating disorders. So when we, when we think about why that there disparity exists, that there's a lot of factors. There's genetic vulnerability, there's endocrine factors or psychosocial contributors or propensity to respond negatively to certain early life stressors in boys that have been proposed or investigate as potential contributors to the sexual dimorphism we see here. And then in adult samples, the difference between males and females, this is good, that it, it kind of goes away or is more modest or absent. It is not as pronounced as three to one to 16 to one. And this could be because in adult samples, you have a greater reliance on self-report uh, or a greater persistence in females alongside maybe 
decreasing remission in males. We don't know. The jury's still out on that. So let's summarize myth two, okay? ADHD is not overdiagnosed. It's actually undertreated. Uh, there may be a racial bias at play here. And then there are differences in the way males and females present in their symptom profile, uh, but they're all still equally affected. So myth three, these are some bad parents here, right? If you're familiar with Harry Potter, these are the, the Dursleys and these are Harry Potter's guardians. They're bad. So next question, poor parenting is associated with ADHD. And I'm going to speed it up a bit. Five, four, three, two, one. True and false. It's actually true. Now, remember, association does not equal causation. Okay, so let's talk about this for a minute. This, of course, is the other mother. She is not a good mother. She wants to take out your eyes and give you buttons. Okay, we don't want this. So most agree that there is genetic and neurological factors that account for a lot of ADHD. However, there's some twin studies of children with ADHD that show that the family environments of the children contribute very little to their individual differences in ADHD symptoms. But which gene is it? Nobody can tell you which gene it's on. So research studies point to a genetic or a hereditary uh, factor, but again, the specifics is, is hard to pinpoint. This, there is some neurotransmitter dysregulation from the frontal uh, subcortical network, particularly of dopamine and serotonin receptors and proteins. Uh, but there are several candidate genes influencing dopamine and serotonin transmission that have been suggested, but there is not enough evidence to support an underlying candidate gene or copy number. But, so there is genetic, but there's also intrauterine factors that contribute to ADHD. If your mommies, so for my NICU present people who are here today, mommies who are doing alcohol, smoking tobacco, doing opioids, hell, even moms who take Tylenol, place kids at increased risk for ADHD, especially if they do this during pregnancy. Now, the contribution of maternal therapeutic medications is less clear. Now, what about birth? Of course, birth circumstances also uh, play a role here. So if they're premature both and low birth weight are very clearly associated with ADHD, particularly the inattentive type. Is that because maybe they didn't have enough stores to build up in the brain? Who knows? Uh, but that is something we see. Uh, also prolonged stress on the infant, intrapartum hemorrhage can have an effect. Uh, eclampsia and prolonged delivery are all associated with ADHD, although no casual mechanisms have been clearly evident. So that's important. Association does not equal causation. The other thing is ACEs. So ACEs are adverse childhood events. Okay, these are clearly suggested and associated with ADHD. And this is where poor parenting can be associated with ADHD. So an ACE is something that if a kid witnessed adversely, they get removed from their family. They witness the family member being deported from them. They see dad beat the crap out of mom, or they see mom murder dad. All these things adversely affect a child. And that obviously if dad has beaten mom, okay, you're not a good parent. Uh, yeah, that's going to be associated with ADHD. So again, the McAllisters, these are bad parents too. Not only did they leave their child at home, they did it twice. They left him two times and they made a movie out of it. Uh, so we know that there are strong genetic relationships, but it's a muddy picture as evidenced by uh, environment and extraneous stressors. Let's talk about myth four, substance abuse. So very quickly, again, what do y'all think about when you hear the word stimulants? Adderall, ADHD, first line, abuse, addiction, drugs, focus, limitless, primed, mothers, caffeine, 
So the big ones are abuse, ADHD, focus are the things that most people are typing here. Anxiety, calm, potential. Okay. Let's keep on cruising. I love it. So let's talk about ADHD and treatment. Okay. So there are things that we tend to worry about with ADHD. And of course, the big one is substance abuse. I was vet by a rep just this week for Jordan APM. And in big, bold words right there, warning, abuse and dependence with this drug, with all these kinds of things. That's what we all worry about. Now, ADHD in general has increased risk for substance abuse given impulsivity. However, studies have shown that stimulants have a protective effect or a neutral effect when it comes to side effect and not hardly any study has shown that there's an increased risk of substance abuse. And what we actually see in a number of pathologies and cases, when patients who have ADHD are taking the drugs that are meant for them, we don't see abuse independence. In fact, I see most of the opposite. Kids don't like to take their medicine. I was one of them. I remember a couple of times I'd hide my pill under the mattress. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I didn't like how it made me feel. Uh, no problems with abuse. Now, you also see this with things like panic disorder. The most addictive drug out there is Xanax. But when people with panic disorder take Xanax, they don't abuse their Xanax because they just want to feel normal. It's the same with ADHD. Substance abuse doesn't happen as much uh, compared to if they weren't treated because they're, again, you're treating the condition they have. They want to feel normal. Uh, we shouldn't discriminate, especially when studies are coming out saying that we don't really see this. If anything, there's a protective effect, but most studies show no effect at all on ADHD use of substances. And if kids are actually not medicated, they might increase their substance use uh, to self-medicate or because of, again, their impulsivity. I have a lot of concerns about height. A lot of parents come to me, well, is this gonna make my kids shorter? So this one's fun because there've been a lot of studies on this. Some have said, yeah, it shortens your height. Some have actually found the opposite. There are no hindrance to heights was seen. Now, the, the, me the proposed mechanism is that ADHD decreases your appetite suppression, which is a known side effect of stimulant use. But uh, because your appetite suppressed, they're not taking the nutrition they need to properly grow. All studies agree that if that was true, it would account by a decreased height by about one to two centimeters. However, Majority of studies have not found a correlation. And some of the studies that did find a difference, their p-values were not significant. A couple years ago, I was driving. So if you're here in Amarillo, the movie theater that's right behind the school here, there's a billboard that said ADHD medication causes mass shooting. I got curious. I had to work this up. Now, naturally, the person who paid for this billboard is no longer living and uh, it's been removed. So I had to look this up. And what we found was that this statement came out uh, a couple of years ago. There's a Santa Fe high school shooting where eight students and two teachers were killed. The NRA, President North, said disease isn't Second Amendment. The disease is youngsters who've been drugged with Ritalin since kindergarten as the cause, according to the NRA, for this shooting. Now, obviously, that is clearly political. However, physicians are also political. And these are the things our patients see. These are the things our patients read. How every time a kid went to a movie, they read that. Parents read that. Who wouldn't want, parents wouldn't want their kids to be treated because they don't want to cause a mass shooting, right? Makes sense. Fortunately, I have uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm with me uh, to comment on this. Dr. Malcolm, please tell me your thoughts on uh, that statement by President North. That is one big pile of shit. Thank you. That is one big pile of shit. Uh, and it has to be said, because again, these are the things our patients see. These are the things that they read. And these are good reasons for parents to be scared to use these medications. The problem is they're not true. We have to rely on the science and the data and not our political agendas or outside opinions sway what is scientific and what is not. 
this happens all the time. I dare mention vaccines and autism. That doctor who made that, Dr. Andrew Wakefield, actually admitted he made it up. And people still believe it to this day. Robert De Niro believes in it. Celebrities believe in these kinds of things. You can see how much public opinion has on patients' uh, decision-making capabilities when we don't focus on the science and we run away with thoughts and what politicians or other celebrities say about it. Now, these are things we should be thinking about when it comes to ADHD. Self-esteem is a big one. Being the hyperactive kid in my class, I can't tell you how many times how demoralizing it is. Anders, 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 focus, focus. Why can't you listen? Why can't you listen? Why do you never do this right? These things stack up. In fact, I remember uh, one time I got a, a math question wrong because I didn't understand that five minus seven equaled negative two. And my teacher just lost her school with me. Miss Meadows, my mom remembers her. Uh, side of self-esteem can negatively impact your whole life. It can ruin years of your life. This is an important aspect. The other thing is uh, self-labeling yourself. The kids start to think they're no good. They're not smart. They can't achieve things they want to do because they don't get it, right? Another thing is untreated ADHD. You're more likely to have accidental and non-accidental injuries. You're more likely to die from an accidental injury than you are to get have substance abuse. The other thing is, uh, and if you're treated, these things go down. Life expectancy. If treated, your ADHD people are expected to live longer. School performance. School performance is very, very important. Now, I'm not talking about, it doesn't, I will agree, it's not necessarily important that you got an, a 90 versus an 85 in reading class. However, what is important is that people who do poorly in school, they make less income. On average, ADHD people are more likely to have drop out. They're more likely to get suspended from school. They're more likely to get in trouble. This leads to, on average, a decrease about $10,000 to $15,000 per year that they'll make in their lifetime. Now, if you remember this, if you make less money, you're in a lower socioeconomic status. What happens if you're in a lower socioeconomic status? Your health is worse. This is the health disparities model that affects trillion billions of, uh, maybe not trillion billion, but every like medical disorder known to man, heart disease, poor prenatal care, all of it. Uh, and those are the consequences of performing poorly in school. The other thing is ADHD people are more likely to get divorced. ADHD people are more likely to get divorced. These are very important life consequences. So while we end up worrying about things that don't, the things that might be acute, we're not thinking about the more chronic conditions. If you had a child with ADHD, which side would you want them on? Would you want them on the side where they have better self-esteem, less likely to jump off a roof with an umbrella, uh, less likely, uh, more likely to be successful in school so they can achieve more, make more, provide for their families, have better health, uh, decreased risk of divorce? Or would you be worried about the one to two centimeters of height that they may not get or the substance abuse that we don't see when treated correctly. And also with height, if you're practicing ADHD and treating it correctly, you don't just, here's a prescription, see you back in two years, right? You have to find the right dose, see you back in two weeks, see you back every three months and monitor your height and see how we're doing and adjust the dose as needed. Stimulants are the first line. Now, of course, in children less than the age of six, we see uh, the best is actually parental behavioral therapy. If you live in Amarillo, I'm sorry, you're out of luck there. Uh, we don't have any. However, uh, Dr. Kiani has given me some re re resources, some people that do Zoom visits for that. So there are out there, but they're limited. So in summary, on our final myth, all medications have side effects, but the side effects of not treating this chronic condition is also very important and should go into our decision-making capabilities when we think about where the benefits and the risks lie for these children. These are all my references. There's a lot of them. All right, guys, y'all have a great day and uh, see you next week.